right, people, we're back. Victory and Vice's podcast. Me, Rory Spooner, the return of James Vec, Reese Henley with us again. And as you can see, a very special guest, Mr. Matt Jarvis. Matt, thank you again for taking the time to come on. Very much appreciated. Um, there is a lot we want to discuss with you. Like I said, you before we came on, mate, we're buzzing to have you on. You're probably our biggest guest, although Nicky Hunt might want to fight you over that because <laughs> he's very much adamant he might be. But uh, yeah, it's great to have you on, mate. Um, in terms of obviously... You know, just getting to know you and, and getting a feel for football with you. I suppose the best place to start is, you know, how are you keeping with everything that's been going on? Um, well, to be fair, I, I've been very lucky in the sense that I'm, you know, I'm currently playing at Woking, uh, which is local to me, um, so and it's been able to carry on. So uh, I've been able to train and play games, which is which is great to be be able to get out of the house. I've got two kids. Uh, one of them's again lucky enough to be at school. He's four, yeah. so. So that gives him, you know, a massive, massive outlet to, to go and play with his mates and, and be at school. So that's great. And then we've got a daughter who's just turned one. She was born the week before the first lockdown. So she's had a, a complete lockdown baby, really. So she's been to the farm. <laughs> she's been to the farm once and that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> but as far as that goes, obviously, I've had you know, loads of time to spend at home, which mm. is very rare as a a footballer to be able to spend you know so much time at home with your with your kids when they're so little so that's been a massive plus for me um I missed a lot of my son when he was sort of first year two years of his life I, I was up and down the motorway up in Norwich and yeah um so it's been great to to be able to be bonding with both of them uh, for long periods of time that's the that's the only the, one of the positives of, of lockdown but Apart from that, yeah, just been obviously enjoying doing some, trying to get into the media world a little bit and enjoying doing some podcasts and, and different bits and pieces. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be on tonight. No, it's a pleasure to have you, mate. Thank you again. I mean, in terms of your sort of average day now, I mean, obviously, you know, the Matt Jarvis of maybe a decade ago will have a very different day to the, to the Matt Jarvis now. So in terms of uh, sort of the way sort of non-league football is working, how do you sort of start your day? Do you get up and train by yourself or how, is, how does that work right now? Yeah, well, right now, um, we're Woking are probably the only club that's part-time. So we, we sort of, we have changed slightly during the, the season, we were used to be training on a Tuesday and Thursday evening and then just play games on a Saturday and, and on a Tuesday yeah. night. So, but we, we've been fortunate enough to, to switch it around a little bit. We now train in the morning. So a Thursday morning, um, obviously, if we don't have a game on the Tuesday or Tuesday morning, but it's Saturday, Tuesday for like three months, I think. Yeah. So, it's, um, so it's literally been, we've, we've actually trained on a Monday morning, played Tuesday, trained Thursday, play Saturday. So for me, on the days that I'm not, actually in training with the lads yeah I'm, I'm I'm lucky enough I've got a gym at home that I can I can yeah. use I can do all of that sort of stuff get myself keep myself ticking along um and yeah, I get to do the school run come back go in the gym you know make sure that I'm having everything possible ready to to go again um for the game so it's it's, it's been it is a contrast of, of you know a few you know, a few years ago, but um, it's actually for me it's it's been great to to be able to do all the bits that I need to do, but have a bit more time to to you know family and, and other bits and pieces. So it's it's been a real yeah, really good good year in 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 that sort of side of things. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, it's cool. and with regards to obviously going to to to, to walk in. Um, I think we, we we were discussing this beforehand. I mean, um, one thing that popped up in my research was that um, a certain Martin Tyler was the assistant manager there, and he had a hand in a, a hand in uh, you actually going there. I mean, you did. I mean, you probably weren't playing too much football, and in the in the few years that you know preceded, um, you know, going to walk in. How how did that move come about? Yeah, it was it was interesting. Um, I, I was I'd sort of been let down by a couple of clubs who'd promised me things and it, it didn't happen, and I was just sort of then just decided I was enjoying getting into the media world, and um, I'll get a call from a number that I didn't know, and I answered it because I I seem to always do that, and um, it was like it was like oh hi mate, it's Martin Tyler, and I was like. Yeah, I know. I know the voice. Yeah, I, I, I've got it. Um, and he was like, and I was thinking at the time, I was thinking I've done a few gigs for Sky. What's he wanted me to do? And he was like, I don't know if you know, but I'm the assistant manager at Woking. I was like, what? <laughs> no, I, I did not know that at all. Um, anyway, we had a good chat. I uh, then went and met him. Um, he's actually not too far from me. Uh, 
yeah. so he's quite local to me so we actually met up um you know had a coffee and and had a little chat and then i went and met the manager and and, and that was that really and uh so when you you know have your first training session is uh are you turning around and scoring a, a nice sort of finish and he's on the side and going, I swear you'll never see anything like this ever again? No. <laughs> <laughs> to, to be honest, he, he he's like he's at every training session, he's at every game he possibly can be because he, if he's not commentating, but he's so enthused. He just loves the game, loves yeah. the game. Um, he takes the warm-ups, would you believe? Yeah, I think he's, he's 72, something like <laughs> that. He's, he's, uh, he's brilliant. He's brilliant. Um, just, as I said, just loves, loves the game. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say because you, you mentioned um, with with Martin Tyler, obviously his his football knowledge, you know, we we feared him over the years is is second to none. You know, what what's he sort of like when he's taking a warm ups? What's his uh, his sort of from a coaching aspect? What's he like uh, in that regard? I thought he might have watched a few more warm ups to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> he, no, he, he as I said, he's so enthusiastic. He he loves it, and he 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 obviously is very knowledgeable. But he's got like um, the other staff members of they've all got their their own bits, and they all talk individually. And then Martin's normally at the end, and it's normally like the managers like he's uh, he's a Geordie guy he's ranting and raving and the assistants then having his turn yeah, yeah, and then Martin's at the end of it sort of going a um, bit more polite bit more posh going uh, you know uh, lads you're in such a fortunate position to be still able to play football so go out there and use that as your your you know your encouragement and your you know to go out and win the game and you're like okay Martin yeah <laughs> <laughs> Very nicely put. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doesn't strike me as the hairdryer type, to be honest, Martin. No, nah, <laughs> nah, I, I wouldn't say he's that. No, <laughs> I, I've never seen a posh hairdryer. But I'd be very, I'd be very curious to see what it looks like. To be honest with you, he's, he seems like a really great guy, and obviously he's iconic in terms of his commentary. And the fact that he managed to sort of lure you into that sort of walk inside is is probably one of the more fascinating stories we've had on this podcast to be honest with you because yeah. Nicky Hunt just dropped down the leagues and he was just like I just want to keep playing there was no special assistant managers there was no there was no, no nothing um in terms of obviously you know I know you suffered a lot with injuries and Nicky Hunt himself had a few injuries too and we talked about you know sort of recovery and stuff um and I was asking Nicky you know do you do your due diligence you know how do you still treat recovery the same as you did as the Nicky Hunt, there was a you know, big Sam was Bolton. And he basically said, no, it's a Peroni and a Chinese. That's my recovery now. <laughs> so I was curious to see if you still have that due diligence. Are you still treating it the same way Matt Jarvis did at West Ham? Or is it sort of different now? Uh, I, I'd like to say I, I do as much as I possibly can. Um, you know, bearing in mind I am, I'm going to turn 35 in May. There's yeah. maybe not as, as I suppose, as... as fully 100 percent as i as i once was yeah, but yeah, at the yeah. same time as i am because i am getting older you have to because otherwise you you don't recover and you know i i've had a horrendous few years um when i was at norwich with injury and and for me it was all always about getting back and proving that i can still play um mm. i wanted to play i missed playing I, it was the worst period of my whole life not being able to play for them a few years and struggle to get back, have another injury, have an operation, getting back, have another operation. It was just, and it's not the same thing. So mm -hmm. it, it was a really difficult time, but I was always, you know, getting told that basically the specialists were like, that's all we can do. If it's not, if, if you're still in pain, then you're going to have to retire. And I was like, yeah. no, I, I, I'm not retired. I'm not someone's not telling me that I'm having to stop it's always going to be my terms I'm going to yeah. say I'm 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 stopping and so I always had that determination to get back and then obviously Martin with this opportunity it was like Do you know what that's that's perfect um I've been you know full time since I was 16 so mm -hmm. to then go um, and play local with part time and still being able to enjoy playing football and uh, it was it was just the perfect combination for me yeah. And Sorry. obviously being a player like yourself, Matt, somebody who's built his reputation on, you know, pace and, and, and trickery on the wing, especially at you know at the top level, do you find going down to non-league people just try to kick you up in the air? Do you know what? It's it's not been as bad as I sort of thought, to be honest. I think 
I think you, I, I thought like yourself, I thought I'm going to get the ball and someone's just going to come right and boot me up in the air because they're going to be like, he's not going to, he's not doing me today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but I've had a bit of a mixture really. Like, I've had a lot of players that come up and been like, I'm a West Ham fan or I'm a Wolves fan. And yeah. you know, you've been ledged like, can't believe you know, you're playing here or, or well done. Like brilliant. Nice to meet you. That sort of thing. I haven't had too many of their like, you, you're going to get it. Yeah. So that, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's been, it's been all right. It's been quite, I think, yeah, I suppose it's still time, still time. I best not say anything too more. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, no, it's, it's, it's been great. All I wanted to do was just get back to, to playing football. And that, that, that's exactly what I've been doing. So it, it is what it is. And I, I've been really enjoying it. Oh, it's good to know, mate. It's good to know. The um, I think as fans, sometimes we take it a little bit for granted. And we spoke with other players about this, about the logistics of football. We just don't take into account we, we always look at the professional side of things but the personal side of things like the injuries the mental fatigue from getting injuries as well you know the, the family issues things like that Nicky Hunt again talked to us about moving down south from being up north and he, it completely affected his career and I think yeah. we sometimes take it for granted and that fulfillment aspect that you have now where you just get up and you've got a smile on your face and you're playing that's not an easy thing to come by in football is it? No, I, I, I can completely relate to everything you've just said about what Nicky said, because, you know, for me, my whole life was dedicated to football. Dedic mm -hmm. Like, it, it still is. I mean, we've still got, we've got a plaque in the other room. My wife's got it. It's something like, uh, we interrupt this marriage for the football season. <laughs> you know, it's, it, everything, everything revolves around football because, you, you know, yes, you know, it, financially, it's brilliant. If you're at the top, mm -hmm. it's fantastic. But you, you're your diary isn't you know it's not yours mm. you could you could be like uh, the team's got a day off tomorrow and i could literally just get a call now and go well, you're in tomorrow and i could have something planned but it's it doesn't tough. matter yeah. it's tough you're in tomorrow you could have like you get told when when you're in when you're off when you can go away when you're this when you're everything food drinks kit everything yeah. is your your it's just out of your control the whole time um so and you're you're just told what to do every single day. It's like regimented, and mm. for me, that's what I'm used to. That's what I like. You know, I like being told what to do, when to do it, yeah, when to, yeah. you know, because you just you just go and do it. Um, but you know, being for me, the hardest part was was when I moved to Norwich. I was flying and I got injured, and then I had an operation, and then my son was born, and then yeah. I was up, then I was in, in sort of six days a week. Uh, my wife and son were back down south and I was trying to sort of commute and mm. um, being up there and trying everything to like get myself back fit. And the, as you were saying about the mental side of it is, is it was so difficult because, you know, like I just wanted to play football and I was in pain every day. I couldn't walk properly. And that, that side of things is, is really, really difficult. Um, and then when you've not got everyone around you, obviously I had the players and, and the staff at the, but you, you know, you, you want, I wanted my family around a little mm. bit, but, but it's, it is what it is. You have to just get on with it and you have to try and get yourself through it. And, and as you said, like, you know, for moving from North to South and Nicky is, is, it's, it's totally, it throws you with everything because you've yeah. got family around you. You've got help with this. You've got help with that. Whenever, you know, you use people around you when you're completely a different area it's totally different and you've got to put kids in schools. You've got to move them here. You're, you're changing everything. It's, it is the other side of the game, but I wouldn't, you know, I'm not saying that anyone needs to be like, Oh, get the violins out. It's not yeah. at all. It comes part and parcel with the game of football because it's the best, best job in the world. Yeah. Then just, sorry, and the first time you probably experienced that, obviously moving um, sort of to, to a quite, in, quite a new area for football would probably be, with Wolves maybe and that was probably uh, not only just um, an adjustment in terms of your, your living area sort of thing but it's also the, the stature of the club I mean I, and, and that was probably your first big break so how did you adjust to, 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 to go into a club as big as Wolves? I think it was it was all about it's all about timing and for me that it was just the perfect timing I, I knew I was going to be leaving Gillingham um, I was 19, 20 I think um, my wife uh, now uh, she was she just finished her uni degree she she was going to move she was going to be a teacher so she was she was ready to move so we both went you know I was 20 she was 21 I think um 
and we, we it was like a you know a new challenge a fresh start we we were excited we went you know up to the midlands i had a a fantastic opportunity at wolves um and then she got herself straight into a job and we made friends sort of that way as well and for me moving to, to wolves was the best thing that i could have possibly done uh, the club was fantastic um you know the players the staff everything about it was just incredible um mm. and and that's when you see you know you, it just got better and better for for me personally and, and for you know and for the club it was just a, an amazing five years that i had there yeah i was curious why wolves did you have any other offers apart from wolves yeah, there was a few other clubs that were interested, but I, um, good story. I, um, I was just packing my bags. I was just going to the airport um, with my mates to go away on holiday on a boys' trip, um, and I get a call from my agent to say, "Look, I've just had a call from Mick McCarthy. He wants to meet you in Portugal. He's out there in Portugal. This, I think, was on a. This was a Friday, so he yeah. wants to meet me on Sunday in Portugal. I was like, right. I was like, yeah, no problem. I was like, lads, um, I can't come. <laughs> um, I'm, going to meet, I'm going to meet Mick McCarthy. So I flew out to Portugal in the morning, met Mick McCarthy. And as soon as I met him, you know, there was no other club that I was going to sign for. He was, he probably is the best manager that I've, I've been worked with. He was, yeah. he has that aura about him when you meet him, it, what he said that he wanted to achieve at Wolves and how he was going to do it and what players he had and what players he was wanting me, like why he wanted me to go there. And it was just, such an easy decision so I literally flew back the same morning uh, after meeting him uh, went straight up to Wolves got shown around the stadium which was amazing uh, yeah. and pretty pretty much signed straight away um, so I signed with the uh, the club secretary at the time and then got a lift with him and his wife to the airport got on the same <laughs> same plane as him to Marbella yeah. and uh, <laughs> he went that way I went that way and met my mates and it was just like a celebration me signing at Wolves it was just absolutely amazing that sounds like a cracking holiday like away with the lads and then by the way lads actually we've got a little bit more to celebrate now as well I mean I still get battered a little bit for missing the first three days but, <laughs> but it yeah. was all right <laughs> I know, they'll forgive you that event eventually at some point they will but that's a cracking little story I mean Mick McCarthy is um a very interesting character obviously he's got um such a you know uh, big pedigree in football across you know sort of international football and club football as well and uh, we had a conversation uh, going back to Nicky Hunt about Sam Allardyce and I know obviously you would have played under Sam as well so very curious to get your thoughts on those type of old school managers because when we talked to Nicky about Sam he'd have run through a brick wall for Sam Allardyce he absolutely loved playing for him and you know I get that impression with Mick McCarthy and you as well it's like these old school British managers People call them tactically inept, but they seem to know how to get the best out of players. Would that be a fair share? Definitely. I think with Mick, what he what he brought and what he was, he had that aura. I said he had that aura. He wherever he, he spoke, you know, people listened. Yeah. And he was on the training pitch every single minute of the day, you know, with you, working, making, improving you as a player. Mm -hmm. And the biggest compliment I can give him, he was honest. He would tell you if you were, were playing, if you were playing well. He would tell you if you're not playing and if you're not playing well. And as players, that's all you need. You know, you don't want anyone saying, oh, yeah, you're doing really well. And then he doesn't pick you. Like, he will tell you exactly why. And, you, you know, you can agree or you don't agree. But he, he at least he's telling you the, 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 the truth and why he's made that decision. And I owe him and his staff, like, a huge amount because they improved me as, in a, as a player and got me to... To the level of playing for England, and mm. that, and I still have that great respect with him now. I still I message him when he, you know, all the time when he's got other jobs, and obviously when he's gone to Cardiff now, and you can just see yeah. uh, he, he's still incredible. And look at the run that they're going on. So they're going great guns. Exactly. I mean, I understand what um, Nicky's saying about uh, Sam. You know, he he was he was slightly different in to to Mick, but was was that if you played on on a Saturday and you gave him everything if you won that team no matter what happened during the week that team you were playing on the Saturday you could mm. you know you, if you had a knock you know he didn't mind as long as you were ready for Saturday you were in and that's why players loved him because he you know you could if as long as you gave your all and and you won the game or you got a good result you you, you were in you know it, it was it was fantastic yeah. for to 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 work that way 
I suppose. Yeah, yeah. No, Sam is a fascinating character. He um he is obviously big into sports science. And with somebody like yourself then who suffered a lot of injuries, did that sports science benefit you in any way at all? Well, luckily I didn't really have any uh, at West Ham or, oh, really? or before. It was all oh, after. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but yeah, he, he was such an old school manager in that, in all of the other stuff, but he was huge. He was the first sort of, probably the first manager that come into it mm. and was huge on statistics, GPS vests, everything about like, he broke it down when I first went there. We we finished tenth in our first season in the Premier League, yeah. and he and he right at the beginning of the season he like he said right did a big pre- presentation and was like right on average over the last eight years to finish tenth you need this many points that's this many wins this many draws this many losses that's this many goals scored goals conceded it's you know it's everything about he broke it down into the smallest bit little bits and then he had like how many free kicks you, uh, how many goals you scored off corners, where you would score your free kicks, where you'd score your, from your corners, like the runs you should make, where from crosses, where should you be? Because that's, you know, the, the percentage of scoring is higher in here. You know, he mm-hmm. broke it down so, so much. And you, as players, you sort of, you knew exactly what you were supposed to do, all your roles and responsibilities in the team. He just laid it out for you. And then it was sort of up to you to, to go and do it. Um, so it, it was a massive, it was a contrast of being an old school manager, but having all of this new GPS, everything. And he, yeah. you know, obviously, you know, you can use statistics for whatever you, whatever you want. I remember a couple of times that, you know, I, we played away at Man City and uh, the next game I, I didn't play. And I was like, well, how come I'm not playing? And he, he'd obviously got all the GPS down. <laughs> like, he was like, well, the game before, when we were at home playing whoever, you put this many crosses in. You were in the final third this many times. You did it, and I was like, "We played Man City. I was, yeah, yeah. I was playing left back with our left back." <laughs> yeah, but you know that that's just the way you know it, it was. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fascinating. I mean, in terms of obviously those two clubs that you played for, the big ones like Wolves and and West Ham, they they're going terrific now, and it's great to see because it makes the Premier League so much more competitive. Um, in terms of obviously what they could potentially do in terms of not just growing as clubs, but potentially winning trophies, do you think there's scope for them to win things? Yeah, I think, you know, if, if, if start with Wolves. I think last season was just a huge thing for, for the Premier League, for Wolves as a club. Like they were mm. desperate to get back to, to playing in Europe. And I think it, they were everyone's second team last year everyone wanted them to win because they liked the way that they played they were counter-attacking they had pace they were scoring goals um and I feel like that's what West Ham are sort of doing this year um you know they they they've David Moyes has got his team exactly how he wants them to play and I think every, all of the players has, has sort of bought into it you can see like some of the players that he wasn't really fancying have either gone or are not playing mm. I think everyone else is is really pulling their weight and and and, and they've made some really good signings like Suchek and Kufal uh fantastic signings um yeah. and obviously Lingard's come in and, and yeah hit the ground running and that's that's what they that's what they needed you know you see everyone's playing at the the top of their game at the moment and and that's why they are where they are and and for them to to sort of maybe get into Europe or or sort of try and win a trophy in the next year or so is this it just it makes everything better for the Premier League as you mentioned it's just mm. it's just better for everyone if if all teams are improving and making it interesting yeah yeah expectations in football are a very interesting thing because I always wonder how they differ from players and fans because if you ask a West Ham fan now they're like right we want uh FA Cup next year we want top four and maybe a Europa League one uh and there and as players then do you have the same ambitions as the fans or is it a bit more logical um I would say obviously as players you have expectations you want to achieve um maybe you I don't know. I think, you know, for instance, at West Ham, if you say, I think you know, the players will be looking like, yeah, we, we want to win a cup. Yeah. We want to do well in the cup. You know, we want to get into Europe. Um, you can, obviously, that's what you, you want to achieve and that's your targets. Say, say they don't quite make it. I still think, you know, if they finished in the top eight, it's a fan, fantastic season. Mm. Uh, and, you know, whether the fans the start of the season going we should we should be in Europe and then at the end of the season you see what they've done and finishing eighth or or above 
they'll bite your hand off. It's a fantastic um, uh, position to be in, but obviously fans get a little bit carried away, but you're, <laughs> you're, 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 you're allowed to, and you're expected to, that's the thing. Um, yeah. but, you know, it's just trying to, you've got to have them goals as players. Otherwise, what's the point of playing football? You know, you've got yeah. to have them goals and right, I want to achieve this. I want to be playing in Europe. I want to win a trophy. And if you're not really that fussed, then there's no point being a footballer. No, absolutely. It is absolutely about ambition. And like you said, you have to give the fans something to aim for. Um, now, one thing I, I wanted to ask you as well, just, just you know, as a thought experiment, really, um, out of the sort of the three bigger clubs that you played for, so Norwich, Wolves and, and West Ham, um, obviously these are, these are clubs like everyone else that haven't had fans in over the last you know, year or so. Which team do you think would have suffered the most from, from not having been able to play in front of their, fran- in front of their fans? Not suffered. So who who's done the worst out of it? Do you think is that what you're asking me? Yeah, out of the teams you played with, so yeah. which which ones do you think would have been which set of fans were the most important, most influential? Um, that's difficult because <laughs> obviously West Ham fans, uh, if you're winning, they're absolutely rocking. <laughs> and 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 I, I played at Upton Park, and that was one hell of a place to, to, to enjoy the atmosphere. Um, obviously, if it's not going as well, it might be, it might turn a little bit harder to, yeah, to play yeah, in front yeah. of them. And, and I think, you know, you've got that looking at that this season, uh, if all of the fans were in, would it be the same sort of story potentially? Mm-hmm. I don't know, but I think for this season, Wolves definitely have suffered. I think that's, that's what they've, they've been craving for, um, it doesn't help when you you know Jimenez is it gets injured and, and obviously can't can't play. Um, but the Wolves fans would have would have really helped them definitely this year. Um, and obviously West Ham they're they're absolutely flying, so you don't want to change it at the moment. But to have them fans back in for for West Ham for any sort of Europe ambitions would be incredible, absolutely yeah. incredible. Yeah, speaking of fans and ambitions, sorry, Becky, go on. Oh, I was going to sort of make a little joke, but uh, yeah. um, speaking of flying there, uh, Matt, um, I had you in my uh, FIFA Ultimate Team 2013 and uh, you were a 91 pace. <laughs> and, uh, you were a staple to my Premier League team at the side. You, you much of a FIFA player yourself or is there much uh, at the clubs you were at at the time? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, uh, I'll hold my hands up right now. I actually don't have a console at the moment. <laughs> I, I don't play. I mean, like two kids, three dogs. There's no chance. <laughs> um, but um, obviously, yeah, yeah, you definitely play when you use yourself. There's no question about it. There's no, no one I know that hasn't done that. Mm. <laughs> and I know that all the lads play FIFA in the change rooms that 100% um, I used to always buy myself on Football Manager as well million yeah. that was the first thing I did as a manager <laughs> but wherever I, I was I, I just used yeah. to play George Elacobi up front just all, all the time because he had like 99 strength and I just used to play him up front and he was the, the main guy in every team that I was playing with and you played with him didn't you? I certainly did yeah I still speak to him now he's, he's uh, what a guy is, um, he, is he really that strong? Yeah, he's very strong. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely that strong. Yeah, he, he he's a proper character as well. Such a nice guy. He's got that, you know. If you're ever like in a like a place that you just uh, and you speak to him, he's like bouncing off the walls. He's got such like oh, it's such emotion, such charisma. Like he just wants everyone to be happy, and yeah. he's he, he's a he's a fantastic guy. Yeah. So speaking of the ninety-one pace that uh, the Vecchi was mentioning there. There's very few people that can turn around and say they were a club record signing, especially at a big club like a West Ham. Now, I was curious to get your thoughts on what it's like to play with a price tag. Because when I watched Harry Maguire join Manchester United, for example, that price tag seemed to weigh heavily on him. And obviously, West Ham is a club with expectations. You look at players that you not necessarily replaced, but people are thinking, well, you know, we've had Joe Cole, we've had Frank Lampard, we've had Rio Ferdinand. We now got Matt Jarvis, and he's the record signing. He's the guy that's going to propel us to the land of milk and honey. So, as a guy then that's there with a price tag of give or take 10 million, uh, maybe a few, you know, Sterling here or there, how does that feel? Like, what type of pressure are you under? Yeah, a lot. 
um, I think, you know, everyone knows how big West Ham is yeah. as a club. I think everyone does. Um, but when you when I signed and, you know, you're, you're in central London, you know, everyone's a West Ham fan. Yeah. You know, everyone is around there. It's just whenever ever you go out, you're like, oh, I'm a massive West Ham fan. You're like, wow. You're like, yeah. it's, it's, it's ridiculous. And then, obviously, to then be club record signing, it does it's definitely come with its pressures. Um, but like everyone who's ever been a club record signing, you don't pick the fee. You know, that's nothing yeah. to do with you. It's to do with the clubs. It's nothing that you've tried to go, yeah, I want to be record signing. It's, it's not like that. Uh, but obviously, the, the um, expectations is, is high. Um, for me, it was all about just focusing. I, I managed, I was literally straight in. I trained, I think, once and played straight away on the Saturday against uh, Swansea. It was just like in, train, back out on the pitch and it's perfect because you just get into the, into the team, get training, get playing. And for me, I thought it was a, I thought it was a great first season. Um, expectations, yes, they are high. Um, but for me, you know, I think my last season at Wolves and my first season at West Ham, so that for them two seasons, I put the most crosses in in Europe and the most uh, successful crosses in Europe both seasons. So as a positional sense I <laughs> I thought I'd done I thought yeah. I, I thought I did well I thought I started well so that was a it was a good thing and then obviously straight away in the next season Andy signed for a club record free so it was just straight off my back and onto him <laughs> so it was so it was great <laughs> that the pressure on you then Matt uh, that takes the pressure then, right off me to, yeah to keep putting them crosses in on, on Andy's head you've got to be more accurate um no, I think it was. I think it would be the opposite. He he was very. He told you exactly what he wanted, Andy. And for me, it was e like not easy, but it was it was easier in the sense that all he wanted to do is when he gets to get to the byline, he wanted you to just hang it up for him, because then he could run and absolutely bulldoze everyone in his way to go and win the ball, take out goalkeepers. As, yeah, yeah, it was just it was just a battering ram at times. He was amazing how good he was in the air so you know he he was very like used to be like Java hang it up hey. <laughs> you know, so you get into the byline and just trying to just put it into that area that he could just go and attack it um so it was it was it, you know it's, it's 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 really frustrating because obviously you know at the time he, he, he suffered with injuries um mm. but when I you know that season I put in the most crosses and the most accurate he'd won the most headers in the, I think it was the yeah. Premier League. So you're like, it's, it's going to be an absolute winning combo. Um, it's just unfortunately we didn't play as much together as, as as it would have been lovely. Yeah, chemistry is obviously vital on the pitch. I mean, would he have been one of the strikers you had the most chemistry with or was there a particular one? Um, I always remember Fletch at Wolves. Me yeah. and Fletch had a, a fantastic um, chemistry. Um, it just seemed to just to work. I remember it was at the end of the season, I think it was, we did, uh, we were watching at the awards and he won the golden boot. And so they showed all of his goals. And I just remember sitting there across the room from him, just look, we're looking and then one came in and he scored and I'll be like, yeah. <laughs> and then next one coming up, like, <laughs> yeah and it was just it was just brilliant he was fan he was so good in the air and the thing was we we knew exactly where if i got the ball if i was going down the line he knew where i was going to cross it if i cut inside yeah. of my right foot he knew where i was going to cross it so it was it was subliminal you know if i was cutting in my right foot he knew to make that run across and it just worked and it, you know some sometimes it clicks sometimes it doesn't but it, he was definitely one that um we had a great understanding yeah Telepathy, I believe, is the word. Is that what I'm looking for? Telepathy, That's, mental yeah. telepathy. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, there. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I it just came out of nowhere. Usually, I don't think that smart. <laughs> I won't lie to you. But I thought that sounds an awful lot like mental telepathy, right? No, no, that's very good, man. Very good. Um, in terms of obviously your club career, there's so many great things to look back on. Um, and we were really wanted to talk to you about England as well because obviously you uh, had the one cap, I believe that was correct. And, you know, it's better to have loved and lost than to have never loved at all in that respect. So one cap is better than no caps. Um, so I wanted to get your take on it. So playing for England, I can imagine, is just obviously like it's up there. It's one of the peaks. Me and the lads are going to ask the question, do you think you should have maybe got more than one cap? Um, and you can be I'll, as truthful I'll, as you like. I'll, 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 I would have loved to. I think, I think my performances after my first cap, probably 
probably yes, because if you look at it after my first cap, I think the last 13 games of that season, or, or it might have been the season after, I can't remember. Um, you know, the last 13 games I scored seven goals, I was flying. Um, mm. So it would have been, it would have been nice. But the, the thing that I, I look at it is, I was playing, obviously, at, for Wolves, and it was absolutely amazing. But we were sort of like floating in and around the relegation zone a lot. The players that were in the England team in front of me were like Ashley Young, Theo Wilcott, Aaron Lennon, Stuart Downing, James Milner, who were all playing at clubs that were right at the you know, top six and were playing in Champions League and Europa League. And so for me to have got in amongst them anyway was an amazing achievement. Um, I do would love to say I, I wish I got another cap yes um but as you said it's a it's an it's, you know it's an honor um it's a, you know it's a dream come true every, every kid wants to play for their country and, and I was certainly very lucky and uh, honored to to get uh, to get my cap and how did you get the news via text message um <laughs> it was a sunday evening after the uh win against villa away uh, 1-0 win which i scored um, and then I, on the Sunday night, I get a text message to say, you've been called up to the England squad by the FA. And I was like, nah, this is a wind up. You know, I, I knew I'd been in the preliminary squads for, I think it was the one before or the two before. So I knew I was in the 30 man squad before, but obviously then when it gets cut down, I wasn't in it. Um, so I was like, nah. And then about a minute later, I get a call and it's from the FA saying, look, it's not, it's not a wind up. You are in the England squad. Um, I think you know, 45 minutes is going to come up on Sky Sports News. You need to bring your passport. You need blah, 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 blah. Um, and I was just like, this is absolutely amazing. Um, just uh, what, what can you do? It was just like mind blown. It was pretty, absolutely amazing. Um, yeah. And basically Capello, when I, when I first went, I, he, as I walked in the door, he was like, there, shoot man, like, are you pleased to be here? I was like, absolutely delighted. Yeah. Um, and he was like, your goal against Villa on Saturday it got got you in. He said you were you were close. You were you know yes or you were right on the edge. He said, but that that goal got you in the England squad. So yeah. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's very cool. I mean, the Capello situation is interesting because obviously he's seen you score that goal and he, he knows you're a player, right? So he's he's gone. I'm going to give him a chance. But why do you think it never evolved from that point onwards beyond that one cap? Um, I think the, there was so mine was in March. It's about ten. It's, it's going to be ten years. Yeah, it will take a few days um, now since it what since the cap. But I think the next one after this is when you then get to the qualifiers for the Euros or the World uh, Cup or whatever okay. one it was. So I don't think there was sort of any sort of friendlies as such. I think it was down to the nitty gritty. So it was um, unfortunately. I'm, missed out but the good news on it I was I was either going to be playing for England in the in the Euros or the World Cup I can't remember which one it was or I was getting married so it turns out I, I got married <laughs> <laughs> on, on a serious note would you tri would you delay that wedding for England if, we, looking I, back? I, I, I genuinely we had the conversation and yeah. I 100% I, I would have yeah, yeah gone yeah. Gone played, yeah. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall. <laughs> like, I, like I said, she's been very, very good throughout my whole career because, uh, yeah, well, I've missed and not been able to do a lot of things due to mm. football. But, um, yeah, that might have been an interesting one. But she was all on board um, if, if it was that we would have had to change it. But in the end, we, we didn't. And we actually, we got married in Mauritius. So it would have been one hell of a change of schedule if we had to but hey yeah. these things happen for a reason yeah sorry becky go on um, i was just going to say um me and the lads we were speaking before the pod matt and you mentioned some of the names of the the players um that you were sort of competing against at the time um and sort of wing spots and you know it's compared to the sort of the options that they have now um you know we, we all thought that you were very competitive amongst those names. And do, do you think there's there's an element of, because you touched upon it, of if you're playing for a club sort of towards the lower end of the table rather than the higher end, how much of that do you think there is in there? Because you talk about players like, there's a lot of people saying Patrick Bamford's been unlucky to get a sort of an England call-up amongst other names. And some would say it's because he plays for Leeds and he doesn't play for 
higher club. Do, do, do you think that, you know, you, you mentioned it, do you think there's a, a big element that is because you're at the lower end of the club? I think, the- I think, I think before the, 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 there might have been a little bit, but that's no disrespect because the players that were getting called up were, you know, incredible incredible players are all playing in Europe and different mm. things. So it's, 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 it's difficult to, to say that, you know, because, you know, you're playing at a team that's relegate in relegation fights or whatever that you're not going to get in. But I think, I think definitely in recent years, it doesn't matter where you are. I think Southgate's proved that if you're playing well, you'll get picked. Um, yeah. Obviously Bamford will be disappointed. I played with Pat at Norwich. Um, mm. So yeah, obviously he'll be disappointed because his his goal scoring record this season has been fantastic. Um, but you look at the competition for places now. That that team is 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 got some great pedigree. There are a lot of young players in there that are performing. So, and it doesn't matter who's who's playing where. You know, if you if you're in a team in the Premier League now, you know it's they're all top 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 players and top teams. So it's um, I think it's, it's it's slightly different from before. I think there was a bigger Gulf in mm. gap between top teams and and the, the lower teams. I think now it's it's you know a, a lot tighter. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of Capello, because me and the lads we watched um, a podcast with Ben Foster. You may have seen it. Have you seen the interview he gave about Capello? I think I've seen. Some, yeah, a, a obviously. Interview. Yeah, yeah. So he, he mentions obviously Capello and there's there's no tomato ketchup allowed, there's no butter allowed. And it's funny you mentioned Mauritius because I smiled to myself because obviously me and Vecchi were on about this earlier on. The story where basically um, Ben Foster's missus gives birth. So obviously he leaves the England uh, training uh, camp to go see his missus. So he's with his missus and he gets a phone call then and Capello says, I need you to come back. You're going to play you know, either the first or second half of the game. And then obviously he goes back and Capello doesn't play him at all. So I'm just sat here thinking, imagine you're in Mauritius getting married to the missus. And obviously Capello's like, I need you to come back. And all of a sudden he doesn't play you. So you may have dodged a bullet a little bit, like you know, in, <laughs> in that respect. Yeah, that would have been interesting, wouldn't it? It would have been <laughs> really, really interesting. But I know I do you know what I did hear that podcast. Um, yeah. I think uh, that is, 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 is yeah. I mean, what can you say? Yeah, you don't get any time off anyway, as it is to to um, you know, to spend with your family when you've just had a baby. I think I got. I mean, I say we were lucky. We we sort of vaguely sort of planned that um, you know our, our son was born in and around the international break. <laughs> so, I say we planned. It just sort of happened. That yeah, he, yeah, yeah. So I man, I managed to get two days off. You know, and that was it. You know, then you're back straight back in. So for him to, it's the it's, it's international break again. He could have had like at least five days with him, but yeah, t- turns out no. <laughs> so, yeah. Any stories from when you were working on the Capel or Tall end thing that you found was a bit bizarre in the way that he did things? Not, but I don't think like bizarre. I, I one of the things that I actually sort of quite liked about it was you know whenever the lads had like whenever we had dinner or you know, whatever it was lunch breakfast whatever everyone had to be there before you went into the room so you all had to be there as a group and then you could go in sit down and then everyone had to be finished before you leave. So if, you, if there's someone lads still having their seconds yeah, or yeah, thirds, yeah. they'll be looking around and everyone's like, come on, like, come on. Yeah. <laughs> but it, I thought it was quite good, like getting team, you know, everyone together, making sure that it was, you know, it was, you, know you all go in as a team, you all come out as a team. There's no dripping in and out. And so that, that's one of the things. But by all accounts on, on the trip that I was on, the, the previous few were a hell of a lot more strict. I think yeah. he slightly loosened the reins a little bit on the trip that I was on. So, yeah, yeah. it could have been uh, could have been a bit more. And yeah, the like culprits to be having seconds and thirds and and uh... potentially me, I would say. <laughs> but I, I did get a, like one of them. Like, yeah. stop now. <laughs> it's good food yeah. in England, I suppose, isn't it? Great, great food, great food. <laughs> one of the actual head chef at England was actually the player liaison at West Ham when I when I went there. So I was like. What, what, yeah. what are you doing? He's like, oh yeah, I'm I, I'm player liaison, but I also do the I'm the head chef at Inga. I was like, what? <laughs> Ridiculous! Yeah. Why are you not the chef here? <laughs> but no, no. Yeah, it's a small world, isn't it? Who was um, so, who was your England captain at the time when you was it? 
was Terry was the when he oh, when I got that yeah. camp was yeah. yeah he had just been reinstated as captain. Ah, yeah. interesting. Did did he sort of pull you to one side? Obviously, with it being sort of your debut. He was brilliant, I have to say. Um, yeah. The in the we played Wales in the qualifier, and then I think the week after the international break, I think it was like Champions League. So the, some of the big hitters they didn't play in the in the Ghana game. Mm. They went they went back. So in the morning of the game, I get a text from Terry like, you know, uh, just want to like, wish you all the best. You know, you you deserve to be here. So go and enjoy it and. Blah, blah blah. It was it was you know he didn't need to do it, but as you said, like he's he was a fantastic captain, and, and it gives you that like oh you know brilliant. Thank you, like, I'm yeah. going for it. Um, so yeah, he didn't need to do it. It was a, it was a really nice thing to do. So yeah, yeah, that was a nice touch. Obviously, the capel. When we hear about the capel or rain, we hear uh, a lot not a lot of bad things, I suppose, but a lot of disgruntled things. So when you see things like that, it gives it a, a bit more of a, a nicer context, and you think to yourself, "Oh, you know what? It wasn't all bad then." In that no, respect. I mean, for for me, you yeah, know, what could I complain yeah. about? It was the best trip you could be on. <laughs> I was yeah, going and playing for England. Yeah, I had all of the best players in the in England around me. Mm. It was it was a fantastic trip. So and obviously Capello. You know, he won absolutely everything. His yeah. his record was ridiculous. So to actually learn and and observe everything that was going on was was huge. I remember as soon as I got back, um, Mick McCarthy was like, you know, pulled me to one side. He was like, you know, congratulations, well done. He goes, right now, <laughs> like, that's gone. <laughs> you know, you're going you're going to have to work even harder now because people yeah. are going to pinpoint you and go. Matt Jarvis, England international, he's not getting the better of me today. So it yeah. was like, you've got to now have to adapt your game, raise your game. And he was like, you know, great. Glad you enjoyed it. Well done. <laughs> Brought me straight back down to earth. And it yeah. was like, you know what? Brilliant. Yeah, it was good. On that, yeah. uh, on that subject, Matt, we, we, you know, we always ask, um, I mean, you're not actually the first winger that we've uh, we've interviewed. We, we, we talked to Nobby Solano. Uh, a few weeks ago, but he didn't quite, I, I suppose he didn't quite have the pace that you had. Um, I mean, I suppose to some extent he wasn't quite the out and out wide man. Um, no. I mean, out of the right backs you faced, was there any that you really relished playing against? Like any you thought you had really had the beating of? To, to be honest, I, I, if I'm completely honest, I love playing against them all. Um, you know, that some games were, you know, like for instance, if I played, I played against Carl Walker loads of times and, Yes, he was a pain because you had to chase him back all the time because he was mm. like lightning and always wanted to go forward. But he always sort of left me like, I'm going to have a chance here because he's going to be going yeah. that way and I'm nicking the ball and I can run that way. And so I really enjoyed them sort of battles. But there's so many that you can say, like Glenn Johnson was, again, brilliant going the other way. And when you're, he was, at, I think it was Liverpool at the time. And, you know, when they're dominating possession and they're, bombing forward and you're defending all the time but as, as, as soon as you get your opportunity to, to attack I've relished it the same with like Zabaleta when he first comes to Man City mm. he was like a rash up, you know right tight against you like trying to nick the ball all the time but I love playing against him you know it, you're testing yourself against the best players in the world and it was it was awesome I, I, I absolutely genuinely loved it um I, I'd give you a name that was uh not surprising because he's a fantastic Playing, he's still playing in the Premier League, but Phil Bardsley, he was hard to play against really? as well. Really, he, he was like one of them that you love to tackle, love to you know, you know leave a bit on you, but also yeah. you know wanted to go forward. And he he was he was more like just wouldn't give you a yard. Um, but again, just love playing against all different types of of, of fullbacks because that's how you improve and that's how you. Uh, you test yourself, so it was it was it was great fun. Absolutely yeah. loved it. Was there a certain amount of sort of honour amongst thieves there, or was it, uh, or was it very much uh, you know fierce? No, I don't think it was. You know, I think that's when it's a little bit more. Maybe you're a little bit younger and you're trying to. Do it. But I think when when I was playing in the Premier League, it was never one of them that someone's turned around and you go, oh, I'm going to break your legs. It was never like that. I think... You, I think the- Nicky Hunter, you missed the Nicky Hunt days. Cause- <laughs> no, <laughs> I, do, I, do you know what I was going to say? I think I might have played against him and he might have tried <laughs> to do that. But um, yeah, it, it was just, yeah, it, that's the biggest thing about the Premier League. The, the, the difference, I suppose, from the Premier League to the Championship is in the Premier League, you've got more time on the ball. 
Mm -hmm. So they gave you that bit more respect, I think. But then it was actually harder to do anything with. So yeah. to, to take someone on or to, to get that shot away, you think, oh, they're standing off me. I'll go and have a shot. And then as soon as you go to shoot, they're, they're right there and they're blocking it. Whereas yeah. in the championship, you get less time on the ball because everyone's chasing and you know pressing as high as they possibly can. But if you nip past someone, you're away. Yeah, and, and you just got punished in the Premier League, whereas the Championship, maybe you could get lucky and, you know, they had two chances, missed two. Premier League, you give them one chance, they're scoring. And that's that was the difference. Yeah, I didn't expect Phil Bardsley to come up, but ever since I saw him lay out Wayne Rooney, I think to myself, no, yeah, Phil's got a bit about him. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, that. no, yeah. that's, a, that's a good show, mate. That's a good show. Um, yeah. Lads, I believe we have some Instagram questions from Matt as well. That's correct. Yeah, um, so I've had a few questions on Instagram from Matt, uh, from Jay Wareham. Um, so what was your favourite moment at Wolves? I think you can't go wrong with winning the championship. What a, what a season. Um, I think, you know, winning games is enjoyable and we, we had such a good year. You know, we were just playing expansive football, 4-4-2, get it wide, put it in the box. It was like, the, we're going to score more goals than you. I think that was just the attitude it was and and I think right from pre-season, we knew we, were, we had an unbelievable team that we were going to go and do something. So that season for me was probably, at Wolves, was the most enjoyable. It's, you know, what, what's not to like about winning games every week, scoring goals, winning games, winning the league, getting a trophy, going to Vegas. <laughs> Great. <laughs> that sounds like my ideal year, if I'm not if I'm honest with you. You just can't beat it, can you? Yeah. <laughs> that sounds great. Uh, we've got another one from Viva Dixit on uh, on Instagram. How did it feel? Obviously, you've said how it felt to make your uh, England debut, but um, uh, what you know, what is it about wearing the jersey that, that that is so special? Like I said, I think you know, for me, it's it's what you dream about with, as a as a kid. You know, whenever you start playing football, it's like, what do you want to do? Oh, you want to play in the Premier League or that? But you always go. I want to play for my country. Imagine playing for your country. That would be amazing. Mm. And, and I, you still get the tingles now of, of that feeling when I was putting on the shirt and then just standing there going, you know, the, the ball goes up and I think Jack Wilshire come off and I was just like, yeah. And then just that feeling of when I crossed the line and ran onto the pitch, I was like, I've done it. I, I, I've, 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 you know, dream come true. I've played for, played for England. Yeah. And then obviously once the whistle goes, you're sort of mentally, you're, you're back into your everyday playing football. But that initial bit of jogging onto the pitch was like, I've, I've done it. I've played for my country. This is, no one can take this away from me. It's, it's absolutely yeah. amazing. And that feeling is something special. Yeah, I think we can all agree it would be definitely a, a, a dream come true for all of us. I was going to say, um, if, I, I, if, if you give me two seconds, I'm going to grab something. Yeah, by all means, mate, yeah. I don't think we've ever had props, lads, on the show, but oh, oh, oh. there oh, we go. Man. That that must take pride of place. So yeah, it's uh yeah. Wow. Wow. Oh, mate. You know, it and then look. Oh, <laughs> <music. laughs> That's class. So there you that, go. That is different gravy. Who actually gives you the cap then? Because I've never um, actually. I, I actually got presented mine by Mick McCarthy because it got sent to the train ground and um, ah. he, present, he presented it to me in front of all the lads and that's how it was. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Oh, that's, that's, incredible. that's incredible. That is and, incredible. Um, and we've got another question as well, Matt. Um, now, this is from Dav Davis on, on Instagram and I, I haven't fact-checked this one. So, um, But under Terry Connors' Wolves, you were down 4-0 at half-time against Swansea and came back to 4 all. He was wondering... What was said at half time? What was the mindset? I think for us there was nothing to lose. Um, you know, no one expected us to to stay up that year. No one expected us to do anything. You know, Mick McCarthy had been sacked. Everyone just expected us to roll over. And I think being four 0 down, it was like, well, we really don't have anything to. Yeah, we, we've got to just go for it and give give ourselves a bit of pride. Um, and the fans and obviously the, the club and, and it was just like we you know we need to go out and give it absolutely everything in the second half and turn us around and yeah I think I scored two that game I think so 
We'll yeah. take your word on that. We didn't fact yeah, check it. So I scored four. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think yeah, I think I scored two that game. Yeah, but it was um, yeah, that was the attitude. Like you know, there's there's no point. You know, we've just got to go for it. There's there's you know, no point just rolling over. We we've, we've got to show everyone that we actually we're we're going to dig in and and do everything for especially for you know for for me like for Terry Connor and for all of the fans. I think. Personally, yes, you want to do well for yourself, but it's it's you know it's more important to for us at the time was for for TC and the fans. It's probably one of the lesser known comebacks, if I'm honest, because when people talk about the great the great comebacks, I mean, you know, as a Newcastle fan, the one always sticks out to me is that you know the four with Arsenal, but you know people don't really know too much about the, the, the four. So I mean, suppose we can. I don't, I don't think it sort of mattered, unfortunately. Um, yeah, if it was one of them that at the end of it we then stayed up, it could be talked about. But unfortunately, it, it wasn't. So it's just sort of swept under yeah. the carpet. <laughs> Probably yeah. was actually one of the great comebacks. So you know, I suppose we'd have to thank Dad for reminding everyone of it. Yeah, yeah. It's a shame that nobody will talk about your four goals, Matt. You know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. We 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 will just uh, maybe maybe <laughs> that. But, yeah. <laughs> I've only ever had one match ball, and that was uh, for a school. So. <laughs> really, I would have thought you would have had loads growing up. Like, yeah, yeah. but yeah, you know, when it comes to like you know growing up, yes, yeah. but not in the uh, actual competitive uh, games, unfortunately. No, no hat trick for me. And like you had a couple of questions as well. Yeah, so I got two questions as well, Matt. We had one um, from uh, Richard Jones, and he said. Um, having played at the top level in England uh, for many seasons, um, would you have liked to have tested yourself in a foreign league? And did you ever have any um, offers or opportunities at any point? I, to be honest, I never ever thought about playing anywhere else other than in England in the Premier League um, through most of my career. Um, I think it's the best league in the world. I, I just wanted to to play there. Um mm. I think the more you get a little bit older when I was sort of having that difficult spell in Norwich and after that, I thought, you know, maybe it would be good to get a bit of a different, you know, way of life, different, you know, I don't know, um, opportunity. But in the end, I, I didn't want, I, you know, I never really looked into it because I, I think I probably missed a boat in my age as well. But I also think that I didn't want to. I then had kids you know, I didn't want to take them anywhere. I wanted to stay and and, and play in, in in England. Um, so to answer your question, no, not really. I always wanted to play in the Premier League, and I was I was able to do that for eight nine years. So I was uh, I was delighted. Do you have any any offers though from any any clubs? Or any uh, 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 I I do remember once hearing that Villarreal at some point, but oh. it was it was yeah. You know, it wasn't they. They've made an offer or anything. It was just half. Oh, apparently, you know that they're, yeah. they're really they're really interested in yeah, But it, it, nothing. I never really pushed to, to do anything because I wanted to stay in the Premier yeah. League. No, that's that's understandable. Um, and then the last question is from uh, Jacob Thomas, um, and he asked that uh, who was the most influential player you played with at Wolves, and who was the best player you played against in the Premier League. So a bit of a two part of that one. Who's the most influential player at Wolves? Other than yourself, of course, obviously. If you're yeah. Free yeah. To say, yeah. Matt Jarvis was In- influential. Um, that's such a difficult question because um, there's so many. It depends on how you're talking about influential. There's, you know, for for me, uh, I don't really suppose I can class him as the, the player, but the fitness coach was Tony Daly. I mean, what what more of an influence I could have, like as a player that played for England in my position, you know, I played in his yeah. position, the same type of player ish. That was a massive, massive influence for me with Terry Connor and Mick. But as players, you know, God, you know, I think um, Doyle had a big influence when he came, um, just for the actual position, uh, the way that we played as yeah. a team. He, he did all of the horrible hard graft and kept the ball uh, to try and get everyone up the pitch. Um, Carl Henry was obviously the, the club captain. He was brilliant team captain, would argue till 
<laughs> he'd argue for 48 hours if he needed to but it, it wasn't even if it was nothing to do with him it was to do with a player that was having he would take it upon himself and he'd be the captain and, and do his role and, and make sure that you know whoever it was got looked after or, or was sorted um so there's loads of different types of influence uh, Jody Craddock was a huge influence in the change yeah. room and, and in the team because of his experience we were such a young squad he was a fantastic influence in, in for everyone and one hell of a guy on a night out as well with fancy <laughs> dress and a lot. He was brilliant. Um, but there's so many, like Sylvan, his goals in the championship were a joke. Yeah. You know, I, I could go through the team because Kites was exceptional. You know, Kev Foley was minimum seven, eight, eight out of 10 every week. You know, it was just ridiculous. The, the, the squad that we had, I, you know, Dave Edward, all these people. Are, uh, uh, and I say like this because we all still speak now. I've yeah. never, yeah, the, a club that's, you've got like probably 18 players-ish that are all still close and all still talk. It's, yeah. you don't get that. And that was because the the, the, the bond that we had was was incredible. Yeah. yeah. I always remember, oh, sorry, go on, mate. I was just going to say that there was a second part of that question, wasn't it? They asked oh, yeah. that. Um, who's the best who's player who played against? Who played against in the Premier I mean, take take your pick. To be honest, they're unbelievable. All of these players, you know, you could go for Rooney, Gerrard, Lampard, Scholes, Joe Cole, um, Drogba. Um, who? I mean, it's just yeah, there's it's, some it's, names it's, there. It's just ridiculous. It depends. You know, you, you pick a position and you can try and pick. You know, JT Ashley Cole is probably the best fullback in Premier League history. Yeah. You know, look at all these goalkeeper Van der Sar. You could pay your check. <laughs> just, yeah, just, 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 just ridiculous. Um, so yeah, crazy, crazy. I don't know if you Hazard as well. Just ridiculous, ridiculous players. But. If you thought that that question was a bit difficult, then I'm sorry if, if, the, if the next one is going to stump you, right? But um, I just wanted to read you out sort of five words, five terms. Um, and I want you to, out of the players that you played with in your whole career, I want you to try and tell me what player suits that word the best, okay. if, if you can, and why. Um, so, so the first word that I've gone for here is uh, underrated. Oh, um... trying to think back to all of my different things um, most underrated player I'll be honest Matt I can't believe I forgot Kevin Doyle I'm sat here thinking <laughs> how have I forgot that lad what the a one, player the I, would, I, would, I, would, I don't know um, even someone like I mentioned like Kev Foley I think he was under, under underrated I think he was a fantastic fullback never ever let you down was constantly comfortable in possession always wanted to go forward played in a number of positions it was very underrated player for me do you, think joe, do you think joe cole was underrated to some extent do you know what uh, for his whole career yes i think he's you know at parts like when he was at west ham he was never underrated as in a youngster i think mm. when he went to chelsea i don't think he was underrated there but then if you look back on his career as a whole, I do think you, you, you look and think, oh, he, I think he's underrated. His CV and what he's done in the game is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, and, you know, so, yeah, I, I, could, I could definitely agree with you that, that he was underrated. But I don't, I don't think that many people would say, oh, yeah, he's, he was all right. He was unbelievable. So yeah. maybe not as, as underrated as, as other people, but certainly... I think on on his career as a whole, he was definitely underrated in the in the sense that he, what he's won and what he's achieved and the caps that he's got for England and yeah, amazing. And then the next one I've got is Joker. Joker, well, there's a few. Um, I would say one for, uh, that Graham Stack was a fantastic. Yeah. He was brilliant um, as a you know in a change when we come to Wolves and he was he, he just just amazing you know that he just made the change room light up you know it was he was always making jokes he didn't do anything he was brilliant um who else do we have God. He's playing Graham, i think isn't he I, I, I mean, he's at what no he's, he's at watford now as the goalie coach 
Oh, right, okay. He was yeah. wasn't he? Yeah, I think he's, yeah. Um, What's the best William Stack story? Oh, I'll tell you a good story about him. We were on our way back from a Christmas do, I think it was. So we had, we had two, I think, um, two like, you know, I think it was two coaches, two buses that was bringing us back. And we were stuck on the M6, big traffic jam. And then suddenly you just look left and there was like this like van with a trailer on the back and it had like a Harley Davidson on the back. And he was just like, yeah, I'm going. And he opened the <laughs> opened the door, ran down the motorway, jumped on the back of this Harley, and was just sat there like, and um, and obviously like you just yeah a couple of minutes, and then the traffic all started to go in, and he still sat in the back of this, like, <laughs> and then he had to like jump off and sprint like trying to get back on the bus and that. But just great, great stories. Just great to be around. He was uh, <clears throat> yeah, good joker. And then the last one I've got here is teacher's pet. Oh. Um, teacher's pet. I was there anyone that stuck up to the coach, like stayed around the course trying to get picked? Like, you know, in Sunday league, yeah, you I know. Where you try and stand next to him so you get subbed on. That kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know what you mean. I don't think I've come across there's there's any that have been like that, like properly, like um, yeah, I don't, not like parched as um, as as Crouchy would say. Um, no, I don't think I've come across too many that are you know proper like that. So I've, I've I suppose I've been lucky. Fair enough. We're not dropping anyone under the bus this time then. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Ask great. Uh, uh, Becky, do you want to teammates? Yeah. So um, the one thing we get uh, many footballers we have on the, the podcast, Matt, we um, ask them to name us uh, their best one to eleven of players they've played with. Um, obviously you can put yourself in I would oh, um, as well. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> or you don't have to put yourself in and obviously pick a, your, your best manager and uh, formation as well okay well to be fair I'm, I'm, I'm gonna sort of reel this off because I'm lucky I did I did this a few weeks ago for for Premier League production so I'm just gonna do exactly the same thing yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll so play. So for me, a team I've played with, you say? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to go Yussi Askelainen in goal. Um, brilliant goalkeeper, first and foremost. Um, uh, when he was at West Ham, he, he looked after him so well. Um, uh, finished training, was in the gym, did everything right, ate right, was a top guy as well. Um, but I think what he's done in the Premier League over his career was amazing um so he was he was my goalkeeper um who did i go i went with um robbie brady left back um, okay, I, I, I know he doesn't really play there now he plays left mid for burnley yeah. or right mid but for the short spell that we had together at norwich we clicked instantly um he played left back i was left mid it was just a, a really good understanding of how we played each other and it just worked really well. I could have gone with Stephen Ward. I could have gone with Cresswell, you know, Joey O'Brien at, at West Ham. Yeah, he, me, and him had a really good understanding as well. But I just went with um, Robbie. Just you know, we, we just we started so well together. It was, um, yeah, really good partnership. Um, I went with James Collins and Winston Reid for my centre halves. Um, I could have. There's a, there's a lot more, a lot of other players you could have gone with, but them two. Ginge was, if you were going into battle with anyone, he, he would yeah. he would be a man. He looked he, like it, yeah. He, he would do absolutely everything possible to win the game. He would throw his head in front of anything. He would block everything. He would literally, he was he was brilliant um, and an amazing guy away from the, uh, the pitch. Um, obviously enjoyed um, the team bondings and, and everything <laughs> as well. So it was, uh, he was yeah, definitely in in the team. Winston Reed was at that point in time. You couldn't get around him. You couldn't get near him. He he, he bullied everyone. He was so strong. He was really good. Worked on his left foot all the time in training. Um, you couldn't get. You just couldn't get the ball off him. You couldn't get near. Every time I went to take him on, I had to knock it like so far wide to get around him because as soon as he got that arm across you, there was no way you were getting past him. Um, so he was he was exceptional for for West Ham at that point. Um, I'm trying to think of my right back was now. It's gone from my mind who I said. Um, I think I went with Foles, to be honest. 
Um, he was just Mr. Consistent. Brilliant mm. at Wolves. Um, fantastic player. As I said, so comfortable on the ball. Mr. Reliable. Played seven, eight out of ten every week. Um, great lad. Absolute great lad. Um, yeah, he was, he, he, you know, just go straight in there right back. Um, then this is where I would be, I'd probably get a lot of teams that would be uh, attacking me because I, I don't really have any defensive players in my midfield. I've got um, I've got Yossi Ben Ayoun on the oh, right. Okay. Underrated. Very Unbe- underrated. Unbelievable player. Um, chop, chop everywhere. Go to shoot, chop back inside, chop the other way. Goalkeeper comes, just dink it over him. He was just amazing. Um, yes, underrated, but uh, again, he's won everything. Um, fantastic player. Really, really, I used to car share with him um, at West Ham. Lo- Lovely guy, really good guy. Uh, again, would do anything for you. Um, but as a player, amazing. I then have Dimitri Payet. Um, yeah. Yeah. What what he'd done that season at West Ham was was incredible. I know it yeah. left a sour note the way it ended at West Ham with the fans and everything. But for that season, he was incredible, absolutely incredible. So he's 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 in. I'm definitely putting Joe Cole in just for what we spoke about before, what a player, what a career he's had. Um, so he's in. Oh, I can't remember who my other ones were now. Um, it's difficult because uh, like, uh, James Madison, I'd put in. Okay. He is a top, top player. Top mm. player. Um, He'd been quite young when you played with him. Yeah, right? yeah. So he come, I remember I remember it. Uh, he, he he signed from commentary and he, he come, he's played, he trained a couple of days, then he went back to commentary on loan for the rest of the season. And then he signed, then he came came on a permanent and, and trained. But that then first two sessions that he trained with us, he was only a young kid and he was ultra confident. He'd come and sat right. And at the time we had quite an experienced change room and he just come straight in, sat in and was like chatting away to everyone. And then, you know, the first training session you you get the ball and you you know you just fire it into him just to see what he, bang it's stuck and then the next one you fired it into him he's already turned and he's gone the other way and you're like okay yeah, <laughs> yeah. and then he's got his opportunity at Norwich and he's not not looked back and he's he's a he's a proper player proper yeah. player so yeah he he would be in there uh one that I would love to fit in but I don't know where I'm gonna put him was where's Houlihan. Oh okay interesting he is an, abso- an absolute magician, absolute magician on the ball. Um, I remember my first sort of one of my first training sessions with him. Like he's got the ball in the middle, and like I was cleaning, and I'm screaming, "I'm going where's where's?" And I sprinted, <laughs> and then like he didn't even look up, didn't acknowledge me, so I stopped my run, and the ball just went exactly where I should have been. And he looked at me like, "What are you doing?" And I was like, "I did. I didn't think you'd seen me." Yeah. He was like. I didn't need to see you, but I, and I was like, apologies. Like, and then I, after that, as soon as you called, he would just find you. He jinked through everyone. Was just a fantastic player. Um, uh, but I'm I'm struggling to see now where I'm going to put everyone in. I would have um, Kev Nolan, or I think I, I think I picked um, Fletch. I think just for pure my relationship the way we linked up i think um i think i went with him up front he's he had a fantastic goal scoring record at wolves and and us as i said we we linked up really well together so i'll go with him i'm trying to think how many that is now is that... that's that's 11 oh, well. oh well, there <laughs> we go very, very attacking 442 though i think that is uh no? yeah i mean the thing is i could have had kev nolan in there i could have andy carroll in there um <laughs> God, there's so many midfielders that I'm not even thinking of right, right now, but off the top of my head. You've got yourself which is great, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't think it looks good if I pick myself. <laughs> yeah. We've got Yaskalainen, um, Brady, Collins, Reed, Bowley, and Ben Ayun, Payet, Joe Cole, James Madison, and then they got Nolan and Fletcher. Did you say there wasn't room for Wes? Oh, I don't know. I think I, you know what. I'll give I'll give Wes. The, oh, it's so <laughs> difficult. Kev was outstanding. A great captain. Brilliant, brilliant yeah. captain. First and foremost was 
amazing from when I first joined uh, West Ham. He was he was instrumental in getting the, the the team together. Everyone has won. Any problems that anyone ever had went to him, and he would go and sort it out with the manager. Um, incredible career, always in the right place at the right time. Knew exactly where to be, which is a skill. It's an incredible skill to to do, and he was a great finisher. Mm. Obviously, had the celebration, which is always great as well. <laughs> um, so it's, it's such a difficult one. I'll, I'll let you two, yeah, you know, let you three pick who you, who you think, Kev or, or Wes. Well, I'm a Newcastle fan, so I'm going Wes. Okay. <laughs> I, I think I go Wes as well. Actually, you sold me Wes there. Like if if, if Wes go. ever needed an agent, it would be you there because you have sold him to me. There we go then. It's Wes, two v one. Or you didn't even get a choice, so unfortunately, <laughs> it's Wes, so yeah. that's just the way it goes in this part. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you'll fall in line. It's fine. Don't worry about it. He's fine. We'll tag Kevin there. We'll put him on the subs bench. Maybe yeah. he'll be too happy with that. No, yeah. he won't be happy with that. So <laughs> I'll get a phone call. Eh? That is a hell of a side. Now I wanted to sort of touch upon teammates with you very quickly because we had a very interesting discussion the other day. Me and Reese and Becky sort of missed it with Helen Ward. Now, Helen Ward is the all-time record Welsh goal scorer. She plays for Watford. And we got to talking about the female game and the differences between the female game and the male game, especially regarding teammates. Now, a lot of her teammates are sort of lesbian. Now, in terms of having gay teammates, we asked her, you know, why is there such a difference or disparity between sort of, you know, the, the female game you know, the, the, there's a lot of players that come out straight away. It's not a big deal. And obviously, we were chatting, the, me and the lads beforehand. I believe you were on the cover of Attitude. Is that correct? Reese still has his copy as well. I'll be on there, by the way. <laughs> but nonetheless, we'll skip past that. So anyway, yeah, obviously, in terms of the sort of the, the disparity, why do you think that is? Like, because we were trying to wrap our heads around it the other day because times have evolved, but it still hasn't kind of moved forward in that respect. Yeah, I, I, I it's such a... It's... It's, it's the taboo, isn't it? Everyone yeah. in, in football, I think, you know, rugby, every, you know, people have come out. I think yeah. football is just that, you know, you can see it at the moment with racism, everything online. Yeah. Um, it's just such a powerful, I suppose, weapon that's being used at the moment is social media. And I think, you know, whoever decides to be, you know, the first person to come out, because other, other players have come out once they've retired. Mm. I think it's just that, I think, you know, abuse, I suppose, from from online on social media or at stadiums with fans. There's no way on earth if if a player came out in the change rooms, it would be a problem. Not a chance. Not a chance. Yeah, Not a chance. Um, like, um, I suppose the, the thing is, isn't it? It's, it's a statistical impossibility that in yeah. in the in the top four leagues that there's there's no gay players. And I suppose if that if we're taking that as, as fact as a, as a fact, then I suppose the two options are that these 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 you know gay footballers either aren't coming out to their teammates or you know they're they're refusing to come out publicly. And then obviously after the teammates, I mean, were you confided in by any teammates in the past? Or? No, no. Um, I think that that's that's the thing, isn't it? Statistically, you you know that, that there is going to be you know um, some gay players out there, and like I said, that it wouldn't it would not no one would ever have a problem with that in the change rooms. Um, but I can completely understand that you know social media makes a it's, it's, it's a huge platform for for people to to abuse people and the fans. You know if 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 people are just going to be trying to do whatever they possibly can to put players off to, to get their team to win, it's always going to be a case that something's going to be said. And unfortunately it's, it's going to be, it's going to take whoever it is to be the first person to, to come out to, it's, it's mm. going to be a, it's going to be a huge moment. And, um, you know, you, you hope that someone's going to be able to, to do that very soon. Cause as you said, it, times are changing, you know, there's so much that's, that's going on these days that, you know, people are, um, you know, the awareness on this awareness on that. I think it's only a matter of time, but you've, as I said, in a, in the change rooms it's it's never, ever going to be a problem. Yeah. It's interesting how people weaponize your sort of, your, your features or your, your sort of life against you, you know, in the, it's, it's win at all costs, isn't it, for yeah. fans? Uh, you know, you, you want um, you want your team to win, and yeah. you're trying everything possible to to get some sort of advantage. And, and unfortunately, that's 
that's you know big nose big ears whatever yeah. it is you, you you're using you're using something to try and put people off and you know it, it's not nice yeah fans i suppose live vicariously through you because they'll never achieve those dreams but if matt jarvis a tree sort of achieves his dream part of me wins as well so how can i then help him win to help me win well that's by attacking the opposition and maybe sort of pointing out, like you said, their features, their sexuality, their race, and things like that. I mean, with the attitude covenant you did, I mean, if you did it now, I, I imagine, obviously, you know, you probably get quite a bit of stick on social media because that's what people do in this day and age, right? I mean, was there a lot of pushback at, the, at that time for you when you did it? To be honest, I, don't get me wrong, I knew it was a big deal at the yes. time, but I, I, I think I underestimated the, um, the amount of, press and yeah. everything about the what happened um you know I, I i'm really proud and pleased that i've done it um mm. you know it, it was it was a massive talking point and and to be honest that uh, you know whenever i had an interview in the in the next sort of two years everyone spoke about that it was like oh you know good game today blah blah so you did the cover of attitude magazine and mm. it was like it was just everyone was just talking about it because it was such a huge deal at, at the time. Yeah. And yeah, 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 I, I, yeah, going into the change room, everyone was having a laugh and a joke, but no one was, it was never any, anything that was, yeah. it was derogatory or personal or anything like that. And, and I got a lot of um, nice like uh, comments or letters and uh, it was, it was just, I, 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 I not amazed, but, uh, it was just a, I didn't realize how much of a, an influence it, it would it would be, um, yeah. and I'm, as I said, I'm really really proud that uh, I was able to do it. Yeah, it's very significant. But even now, when I was reading about it earlier on, I it sort of hit me how significant it was because you don't you haven't really seen another football player do anything since. Well, I'm in good company. There's only three play, football players that have done it, and it was me, <laughs> Freddie Lundberg, and David yeah. Beckham. <laughs> <laughs> What, what other lads could you ask for? Uh, they all had their clothes off as well as you, and I, I'm assuming also you look better than them. You were in a bit better shape. Bex is photoshopped. I... Everyone knows that anyway. So. I mean, I must have done a million press-ups before <laughs> it as well. <laughs> no, I mean, Bex, you did good there. That was um, that was pretty groundbreaking, and um, it'll be interesting to see how uh, that whole situation evolves regarding homosexuality in football, because... Yeah. It's something that's so common in the women's game um, and yeah. the men's game. Yeah, I guess time will reveal all in that respect. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, as I said, I think there's there's quite a few players that have come out since they've retired, and mm. it'll be sort of interesting to 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 know what made them decide to wait until after after football. But you know, it, everyone's got their own opinion and, and and reasons for for their decisions, and and obviously. Like I said, it would never be a problem in in the change room. So it's um yeah. it's obviously the the other factors, you know, you could be thinking, oh, that you know, if I if I did that, that would the club want to do this? Mm. Would the club, the chairman, with the contract and clubs, and you know, there's so many factors that you know, the, 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 that would start going into your mind. So, you know, hopefully, you know, it's uh, it's going to change, and uh, and everyone can you know feel that they can do anything that they possibly want. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Lads, do we have anything else for Matt before we uh, before we let him go? I, I just had one um, question, Matt. Obviously, um, with you know yourself being a wide and you've had your injuries. Um, I mean, we all know there's a shelf life for wingers at the at the end of the day, um, and we've seen that Ryan Giggs obviously had, had explosive pace, and Beckham as well, um, and they, they both towards the end of their careers. It's just obviously high profile names, but at the you know at the end of their careers, they moved into more of a deeper lying sort of central midfield role is that where you see you know you, your next few years or do you look at Jamie O'Hara and so, sort of go um, okay I could do some player management like he's down at Billy Ricky at the moment um, I don't know I don't I think you know once I'm not able to do the things that I have done for 18 years I think it's probably time to call it a day isn't it <laughs> I I um you know, I lost. I, you get, I get a, a, a thrill of of taking people on and and cutting inside on a shot, going down the line and putting crosses in. I, I get I get a thrill, and when I don't have that thrill, I think it's time to to knock it on the head. Um, 
I don't really envisage seeing myself as a deep line holding midfielder. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not really my game. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm going to be enjoying it until the day comes that I'm like, mm, I don't think I can do this anymore. Okay. Yeah. So. yeah, yeah. No, that's a fair shout, mate, in fairness. Was there anything else, lads, that you wanted to touch upon very quickly? We all good? All good. No, no, great. We got our questions out and uh, we, we, yeah. did, we covered everything. Super. Well, Matt, thank you again, mate, for taking the time to come on. Obviously, the pleasure has been all ours. Uh, we could sit here and speak to you for hours and hours and hours and hours about football <laughs> because we're football addicts, mate. We love it. So thank you again for taking the time to come on. Pleasure. Thank you very Pleasure's much. Pleasure's all ours, mate, believe me. So with that being said, if you're not following Matt on the socials, we will put his sort of uh, Twitter and IG handles in the description below. If you haven't already done so, like the video, make sure you subscribe, all that good jazz. Uh, we'll be back next week with a guest that I may or may not be able to announce yet, lads. No? Yes? No? Yet. No, no, yeah. I said the raps, I said the raps, I said the raps. Anyway, right, so we'll be back next week with another guest. We'll see you next time. Take care, people. Ciao for now.